Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that's moving out to L.A., the land of the champions. Here is the captain. Heading out to California. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are sipping on a fantastic lager, I-70 Colorado lager from Odyssey Beer Works. This baby is clean, crisp, bright, and I saw someone describe I-70 Colorado lager as zippy, so we'll back that up. And let's start off by giving some praise to those that got our backs. First up, a cheers to Slats McCracker in Campbelltown, Sydney. And a big shout out to Jenny G in Wisconsin. Next up, we have Mindy in Vancouver, Washington. And a big shout out to Kimberly in Friday Harbor, Washington. Next up, we have Aaron in LA. And last but certainly not least, we have Sydney in Pangborn, England. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and contributed to this week's beer fund. And for that, we give you five out of five bottle caps. Yeah, we're a little bit behind on the beer shout out, so make sure you're patient. But thanks for helping out with the BWWRUN beer run. Make sure you go to our website and sign up on the mailing list so you're in the know when we send out a promo code to the website store. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Twenty-four-year-old Nancy Kitzmiller played soccer throughout high school and at Oklahoma State University, where she graduated with a degree in geography. She returned home after graduation and organized her old high school soccer buddies to play in an indoor soccer league. She loved her country and Western music and was a line dancing fanatic. She had a big smile, blue eyes, and long curly brown hair. Now, Nancy wanted to be a cartographer. She applied for a job with the Defense Mapping Agency headquartered in St. Louis. For this job, she needed top secret security clearance. This is going to take some time to get. And she had been waiting for about a year where we pick up our story in May of 1992. So Nancy's finished with school and she's going to work at a store called Boot Village in St. Charles, Missouri. This is while she's waiting on that security clearance. Nancy's parents say that Nancy was expecting that clearance to come within two weeks of the time of her death. The Bogey Hills Plaza Boot Village store in St. Charles, Missouri opened on Sunday, May 3rd, 1992 at noon that day. Nancy was one of several managers that worked at the store. Well, this location is going to be similar to some of the other locations in this story where, yes, it's a business, but it's surrounded by other businesses. But since it's a Sunday, the other businesses aren't going to be open. Yeah, it's a busy area, and some of these other stores in this immediate area will be closed due to the Sunday. This Western Footwear store is located at 2079 Zumbel or Zumbiel Road, and I'll spell that because I'm a moron in the garage who can't say things. Mm. It's Z-U-M-B-E-H-L Road. Nancy will be working the early shift by herself because business is typically slow on a Sunday. Now, sometime between unlocking the doors for business that day, again at noon, and 2.30 p.m. that afternoon, someone shot Nancy in the head and did take some money from the cash register. Though there were reportedly plenty of people visiting other retail outlets in the area, no one comes forward saying that they heard a gunshot. A passerby did say that they saw the killer, though. The last customer that Nancy Kitzmiller waited on, according to this eyewitness, this person was a male of medium height with dull red hair. Not terribly unlike the description we received from the man retrieving the cummerbund 
right. at the bridal shop. Today, the address of 2079 Zumbiel Road houses a St. Louis bread company. The Boot Village store is no longer there. This is very much, in every way, a similar attack to the others. A employee working in a smaller business by themselves is attacked, shot in the back of the head. There is some money that is stolen from the scene. Again, the location, though, is 2079 Zumbiel Road, St. Charles, Missouri. It's an eight-minute drive to Interstate 70, 3.9 miles away. Wow. And you had asked Captain off mic if we knew exactly how much money was taken or how much money was left. The general description with all five of these events that we are going to go through in the I-70 killer timeline the description is all basically the same that it is agreed upon by investigators that some money was taken from each location but also some money was left at each location this is where you have to wonder what is the holdback information here there has to be something even if it's these quick attacks that are very succinct i mean we have what appears to be a guy walking in to a store and killing an individual, leaving very few clues behind, and also probably spending very little time at the actual crime scene inside the store itself. There does have to be some information that we don't know, that the public does not know, that the police in these areas and these jurisdictions know. How much money was left, how much money was believed to be been taken. The other thing that I'm curious about, we know in one of these attacks that Mick, his wallet was taken. It's curious to me if there were personal items belonging to the victims taken at all of the scenes or at more right. than just that one scene. Yeah. It's very difficult too, because I think like you were saying, it's pretty easy to go. Well, I think murder was the main motive because they're not taking much money. That might just be not much money to you or I. Or for us to go, a couple hundred bucks, I'm not going to kill somebody over a couple hundred bucks. But I wonder if that lowers the age of the suspect we're looking for because obviously a couple hundred bucks to a 17 or 18-year-old kid would be huge. Well, again, here we have a potential other witness. And age has been a bitch for the suspect in this case. Mm. I've seen them put the age range as low as 20 to 30 years of age and as late as 30 to 45 years of age. Yeah, I heard as early as a (laughs) three-year-old. Well, the thing here is if we are to go off of May Rose's witness statement, he was the manager at the paint store. Right. Keep in mind, he says some interesting things that immediately upon seeing this man, if in fact that was the killer, I believed him to be a hitchhiker slash homeless person. Well, typically people that are disheveled, unclean, they can look older than they actually are. And then to to take that a step further, you and I keep honing in on the fact that money was taken from the scene, but money was also left at the scene. We may be trying to rationalize something that there is no rationalization for, meaning if May Rose was correct in his assessment that this individual was either on drugs or had mental problems or both, there may be no rhyme or reason for why this individual's leaving money at the scene. This takes us to our next attack here, Captain. This is May 7th. We're four days out from the last attack. May 7th, 1992, we have Sarah Lynn Blessing working by herself. Her maiden name is Hart, and she's recently married. She's a newlywed as well. Uh, 37 years old, Sarah was a healthy, conscious person, very knowledgeable about natural foods and such. She went to Emporia State College halfway between Topeka and Wichita, earning a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in interpersonal communications with a minor in psychology. 
she was known to be a pet lover. Now, Sarah was born six weeks prematurely and had a younger sister and a younger brother, but her mother, Wilma Hart, recalled, quote, she was always a little thing, but she was the big sister. And she goes on to say that she read constantly and got straight A's in school. Now, Sarah and five of her friends rented a storefront in Raytown, Missouri. Each would set up in an area where they would display their items to sell. These could be things like crystals, vitamins, natural foods, and such. They called it the store of many colors. They would take turns working at the store. The grand opening was 1992 in April, late April, the grand opening week of April 18th to April 26th. So another bizarre situation here, Captain, because we're now on our second store where it has just recently opened. On May 7th, this was a Thursday, it was Sarah's turn to work. She's working alone. That is the day that she was killed. Sarah was in the store alone when a man wearing a gray sports coat, slacks, and dress shoes strolled across the large parking lot toward the shop of many colors, the store that we're talking about. Now, this guy is going to stand out to witnesses because most people drove to the popular strip mall, and, of course, they're going to park right in front of the store that they are intending to go into. So this guy, he's not seen getting out of a vehicle. He's seen walking the distance of the parking lot and then selecting this store, the store of many colors. Tim Hickman owned a video store that was next door to the gift shop where we have our young woman working, where he said that he heard loud bangs. After hearing this, he said that he saw a man walking up the hill behind the shop and he believed heading in the direction of Interstate 70. He goes next door, enters the shop, and discovers Sarah's body lying on the floor. Then we have a clerk at a nearby grocery store who was outside collecting carts. If you look at this location on a map, what we have here, Captain, is we have, let's picture a, a square with three sides and one of the sides not fully complete. But what, what we have by that, pointing that out, is we have shops that are facing one another with a large parking lot in the center of all of these shops. The location of this grocery store, which is the largest shop in this strip mall location, is across the street or across the parking lot, I should say, from the gift shop. What he is going to see is a man exit the gift shop and then walk in the direction behind the store. Behind the store, there's a hill, a street, and then if you go beyond that, there's a neighborhood. But this person, this second eyewitness, says that he saw this man walking away, walking north at 63rd and Woodson, which is just about three miles south of I-70. The suspect was also reported to be walking east down 59th Street approximately 10 minutes later. At that time, the stranger was about three miles south of I-70, so about the same location. Speaking of location, the store is located at 11573 East 63rd Street in Raytown, Missouri. This driving by car would be nine minutes travel time to Interstate 70. It's 4.6 miles away. Which is another similarity in this case as the other cases. Now, obviously, we're connecting them, but this is after law enforcement already did so years ago. Yeah, and I actually heard... Um, it was just one podcast, I think. There were several podcasts on this case. I listened to a portion of one of them, and I don't recall the name, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus anyway, but they had said, you know, it, it, these all these crimes and they're the distance apart 
of course you're not going to connect them and it's the early 90s so the jurisdictions weren't talking to one another so they didn't connect them for years which in fact that's absolutely false that's not correct information Mm -hmm. what we have here is within days of the final attack we have four of the investigating four of the five investigating departments are meeting to collaborate and to discuss potential similarities and see if the crimes are in fact linked and what we have is an immediate warning that comes from these four investigating departments in may that says This is issued a warning issued to stores near interstate highways throughout the entire country saying, be careful. Try not to leave a clerk alone on duty saying we are moving ahead, but just because we had a meeting doesn't mean that we're going to catch the guy tomorrow. These things are going to take some time. Now we said four of the five investigating departments. That is because there was a bit of a squabble over whether or not the Wichita homicides were connected to the others or not. We have Indiana State Police Detective Crook who said, without elaborating on the details, that there were certain factors about the Wichita slayings that were different from the others. Yeah, but you're going to have that. I mean, not every serial killer or expert in crime commits the crime 100% the same way every time. Right. And what's so funny about this portion of the story, to me anyway, is that he goes on to say on the record, this is one of those moments where it's like, it's like toothpaste. Once it's out of the tube, you can't put it back in. And I, I bet you he wishes that he had not said some of these words. So he says, uh, the Wichita shootings appear to be too far off of I-70. Wichita, meaning their police department, is really hot on the idea that they are involved but we are not. That seems pretty clear cut, but the problem is then just two days later, the Wichita killings were in fact linked to the others. And Rick Pilgrim spokesman for the Metro case squad investigating said, we've been able to come up with common denominators in all of the cases. We have physical evidence linking the crimes. Mm, So maybe hair sample, fingerprint, DNA, something, palm print. I wish that that were the case. I don't think that they have that stuff. Okay. What we do know that is left at all of the crime scenes is bullets. Unfortunately, what I'm saying is that they're going to be able to physically connect these through evidence to each other because of Primarily the bullets. Right. So the bullets, because of ballistics, is basically like a fingerprint for the gun. And we mentioned that we have the warning that was issued by police to basically the entire nation of this guy could hit any store seemingly at random. Please do not have your employees working alone, especially if you're a store that's located near an interstate or a freeway they did offer up some theories immediately early in the get-go of this investigation once they've connected all of these crimes saying that he may be posing as a traveling salesman or the killer may force his way into a store with his gun he may case the area and strike at a time when a single clerk is vulnerable but i think one of the most powerful things that is stated early on in this investigation comes from The assistant police chief in Terre Haute, Indiana, this is Joseph Newport, who says, we were dealing with a serial killer. He's not really getting much money out of the shops. We don't know why he's killing people. I just think he wants to kill people. He's going into places that don't have money. If he had gotten every dollar in there, it wouldn't have amounted to much. But I think that's important in this, in the profile of this individual is is maybe even though the amount of money was so little, it was still, they still needed the money. Right. It's something, it's almost like a signature. If in fact it's a a side thought, it's also somewhat necessary to the crime itself. If he is in fact going in there just for the purpose of killing, well, he's taking an extra step that has heightened risk involved with it of taking money from the scene. A lot of what you are discussing is information that came out pretty 
a lot of what we're discussing is information that came out pretty quickly after the crimes. But this next bit is something that came out, I believe, 20 years afterwards. Yeah, in 2012, the St. Charles Police Department released what they believe to be the exact model of the gun used in all of the slangs. And we say all of the slangs, we, I think we really need to hone in on something before we get into the details of this weapon here. What the hell is going on? We have six victims in five events that all take place in a month, a period of just one month. Right. That is, forgive me for saying so, a speedy and efficient killer. We have the first attack that takes place on April 8th, 1992. And then the last known attack is May 7th, 1992. In a one month period, six people killed. It was the uh, Indiana State police or, or maybe it was the Indianapolis city police, pardon me, that came up with the moniker of the I 70 killer. But we know from what they were saying in late May of 92, that all of these events, all of these homicides are connected. And then we fast forward 20 years later to learn in 20, 2012 that they believe that they may know the exact gun to have been used. So lab tests confirmed that all five had been killed by the same gun. This would be a semi-automatic 22 caliber pistol. And based off of witness testimony, police strongly believe that the murder weapon may have been an Irma Work, and I'm going to spell that in case I'm saying it incorrectly, W-E-R-K-E, and it was model uh, a model ET-22 pistol. Now, this is a unique-looking weapon. It's a handgun with a very long barrel, and it also looks like, um, me being a layperson, uh, referred to as a, like a Nazi-looking gun. You know, those little the little handguns that you see in the Indiana Jones movies? Right. Um, the cartridges of the bullets were polished with jeweler's rouge. This is a very specific thing to these crimes okay this is somebody we're talking about expert level of experience with firearms why would anyone polish bullets with jewelers rouge i would have no idea about that i have no clue why anybody would do that until looking into this case what i've been told is that if you were to do this that it's it would prevent the bullets from jamming that it would it would prevent the gun from misfiring, so you don't run into any issues when you're trying to operate your killing machine that you're bringing to the scene of these crimes. Now we say that this weapon is unique. Well, it was in fact unique. Only six thousand were imported to the United States from Germany. So detectives are hoping that someone would recognize this gun and remember if they knew someone who had this rare gun back in the early 90s. The ammunition was CCI brand 22 caliber long rifle with copper clad lead bullets. Police asked all gun enthusiasts and gun dealers to notify them if they see an Irma work model ET-22 or had one stolen from them in the early 90s. The owner, or presumably the killer, may have used corundum or red rouge for fire lapping of the weapon or may have used corundum and rouge in grinding polishing or machine shop work there are many complaints that this gun would not cycle reliably or eject and load a new round again that's why somebody with an expert level of experience would know to use this jeweler's rouge to prevent that from happening. Well, and we have multiple crimes, multiple crime scenes, multiple law enforcement departments working together. What kind of profile, if any, do we have of this individual? That's what's unique, I think, to this. This We have a known serial killer operating. The problem is he's operating in multiple states across many, many miles of land. But 
What's unique to this case amongst the others is I couldn't really find a profile. What I could find is several statements by several different departments that said at the time, you know, early 1992, saying we are working with the FBI to provide them information and details of the crime so that they can put together a psychological profile of the I-70 killer. Well, you look, you wait, you look again, nothing. What you find is a month or two later, a different department saying the same thing. We are working with the FBI to provide them details of the crime so that they can put together a psychological profile. What we have years later, Captain, is we have the uh, Indianapolis police who say that they were working with the FBI, but it was it was yet to be determined years later, <laughs> yet to be determined if yeah. the case is even profile. I'm, I'm having trouble with this profilable. word. Profilable. There you go. Mm-hmm. Thank you. God bless you, Captain. Yeah. If the case is even profilable. Mm-hmm. Because, again, it's like this guy walks into the store, boom, commits the homicide, and then walks out. It's almost like a mix between a serial killer and a spree killer. Yes, exactly. And when it comes down to it, as far as the investigation goes, we have the uh, Indianapolis police on record saying we literally went through and got hotel registrations from every single hotel across Interstate 70 up and down the interstates all over and looked into those. They looked into toll booths. They checked license plates. They checked traffic stops during the times of the attacks. And they've come out and they've been pretty clear and upfront with this is not a DNA case. This killer did not do anything to the victims or uh, the, the attacks were not such that they had DNA evidence left behind of the killer. You had referenced um, fingerprints, palm prints, hair, fibers, anything of that nature earlier. I can't say with certainty that they have that or did not have that. We have multiple crime scenes. And again, every one of the crime scenes is a, for lack of a better term, is a public place. You have many people that could be in and out of these stores and these shops. So they may have that stuff. They also may have that stuff and not able to link it to anybody or aware that they actually have it because you have a crime scene that contains so many fingerprints, so many palm prints, possible hair and fiber. What we do have, the very little bit that we do have as far as a profile would go, we have the physical profile that we've already talked about and we'll talk about again, but we do have law enforcement on record saying that they believe that the suspect could be a military man, a hitchhiker, a traveling salesman, or a truck driver. Because the thought being that there's a possibility that the killer is someone who has a reason to travel beyond just killing. So again, such as a salesman or truck driver. And then along those lines, detectives said that the killer might have dealings with military bases because several of the slayings occurred near military installations, such as Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis. What is up, chicken butt? Cheers, mates, and welcome back. We got a lot more to dive into in the I-70 killer case. For all of you diehard garage listeners out there, we just put out another off-the-record episode on Stitcher Premium yesterday, so make sure you check that out. So in this case, it's not clear, but it seems like there's no 
one source of profile, but we do have a composite for this individual. Yes, we do. And the general consensus seems to be that police describe the suspect as a white male in his mid 20s to mid 30s um, with the remark of but more likely in his mid 30s. Eyewitnesses have described this man as uh, five feet, seven inches to five feet all the way up to five feet, nine inches tall, about 150 pounds with reddish colored or light colored hair and a stubble beard or faint beard. And I might be wrong, but it seems like from the furthest distance from Indianapolis to, I believe it's Wichita, it's a 10 hour radius that we have. So multiple places that this killer could be residing. Do we have any evidence or any clues to pinpoint that down? Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about some gangbusters work that is done being done by a guy going by Quester. Um, I didn't write down his full name here, but it's at questersite.com. He has worked on, just as a armchair detective, has worked on several of these older cases, particularly high-profile cases. Mm -hmm. And he did several posts about the I-70 killer. One thing that the that he points out as far as a pattern goes, because I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, what what's the pattern here? Because we don't have attacks that are taking place in order of, you know, on down the road, one, two, three, four, five. We have five events, six victims, but what Quester points out, and this is, I think this is pretty brilliant here, that he refers to this as um, polling, which is so, so such a great word for uh, everything going on right now in our country. But mm. uh, it has nothing to do with that. What he's saying is, if you take if you take the cr- crimes and put them on a a straight line. What you have is the first crime takes place at the very furthest part of the one line, which would be roughly Indianapolis, Indiana. The next crime, the second one, goes all the way to the other side of that line, the furthest point on that other line. And then the third crime is back again to the east, back in Indiana. The fourth crime is in the middle, and then the fifth is in Raytown. So it's almost like he went to the the furthest away that he could be, which if you go by that rationale, if you're going to use that as maybe your your area, it would it would seem that the killer is probably more in the middle of these crimes rather than all the way in Indianapolis or all the way out in Wichita. That if he started and wanted to kill and felt that he could kill comfortably furthest from where he resides to further the crimes from him as much as possible that he went to the trouble of going as far as he could east and then the next crime he went as far as he wanted west and then he felt a little bit more comfortable because he had gotten away with some uh and then went a little closer to home so maybe he's in the raytown area maybe he's in the missouri area or like you said he's a big traveler and he's not even anywhere close to where he lives. He, he could live all the way on the East Coast or the West Coast. And what we have here too, Captain, is the biggest question that seems to be past who was the I-70 killer. Yeah, that's the biggest one always. Seems to be where did he go? Because we have five events in just a one-month time period And we have six homicides inside those five five events. And then he seemingly disappears. Isn't it kind of weird to you that there's not even a hint of what he was driving? I think that is something that's very smart that you point out. Because what I think he was doing is I don't think this guy was hitching a ride. I don't think that he thought that. It doesn't make a lot of sense. No, it doesn't make any sense at all. Somebody would have came forward and said, you know what, I... I picked up this individual or this individual would have been if again, if the the motive was just murder, why wouldn't they just murder the person that drove them? You right. know, at, at some point. 
Um, right. So there, there seems to be some reason for him carrying out a mission. It's almost like in a video game where you're given a list of, of objectives that you have to achieve on some kind of mission. And it's like, all right, get to this location. One thing that I find interesting is all the stores are very similar. When you think about it, other than the pay less, none of these seem to be much of a, in the way of a chain of stores. Right. And so he's picking small businesses that, with the exception of the one case, are not terribly far from I-70 itself, but all of these locations are similar in the sense that you could park behind the store or behind another store or maybe even in the neighborhood or the streets. We said that most of, if not all of these businesses are backing up to streets and neighborhoods. So if you have a general idea of where you're going to attack and you do not want your car to be seen, because we've talked about this time and time again here in the garage, right? vehicles are 100 times easier to locate than a description of a person. Give me a description of a vehicle. We can find it easier than a description of a person, especially when you tell me it's a white guy in his mid to late, you know, mid twenties to mid thirties. All white people. Look five foot same. seven to five yeah. foot nine. So I think he's parking his vehicle near the crime scene and then going on foot to and from the actual crime scene and then fleeing in his vehicle. Once the crime is committed, we have eyewitness statements where they're saying, I saw a guy who I believe was leaving the store at or around the time of the believed homicide. Right. He's heading in the direction behind the building one person saying, I thought I saw him go behind the building and then up the hill where he would have just went down the hill and he could have parked right on the other side of the hill. What a great obstacle for hiding and concealing your vehicle. Well, and like you were saying, I mean, we, we or again, we have evidence that he was staking out these locations, but almost like in a very genius sort of way, like if you're in these plazas where there's multiple stores, and maybe the store, you know, yes, the store he's going into isn't that busy, but the other stores, they're probably not that busy either, but there's people going in and out of those parking lots all day long. You know, if I was driving up to a strip mall, chances are I'm going to see a couple cars coming in and a couple cars leaving. So if somebody said, oh, did you see that man driving away? No, I, I didn't. I saw multiple cars driving away. So I think that would be a great way to the clutter becomes your cover. Well, and one bizarre thing that is that I find fascinating that might just be pure happenstance beyond the idea of targeting stores that may contain younger ladies working alone. We mentioned several of the stores had only been open. They were under, you know, they're a, a new store. And only open for a month or two. Right. And again, that could just be happenstance. Maybe it's because a newer store has less customers. It's had less time to build up its clientele. So he spots it and it's obviously not busy and goes in and it's just, he wouldn't have known that they were newer stores. But again, the question becomes that many attacks, that many homicides in such a short period of time. And then he's gone. Why? Where did he go? I think... The why to me is pretty obvious. We had the police at the time that very quickly linked all of these crimes together. And he knows I used the same gun at all of these crime scenes. He knows what's linking them. He knows how police have linked them together. So maybe he doesn't disappear. Maybe he doesn't go away forever. He's not this phantom killer that just disappeared. All he's got to do is change guns and he can continue doing what he's doing, especially if he's willing to go to the distance of 10 hours away. Right. So I think what happened here is I think that this guy probably continued on. I think what's interesting to me too, is not just where did he go, but also where did he come from? One thought that jumped out to me was we mentioned military man, is this a guy that saw action? 
that went off to war. We had the Gulf War ended in February of 1991. Desert Shield followed by Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. Did this guy, was he sent over there to serve his country and he got a taste for killing? And then he brought it back here and he couldn't turn it off? You know, so who knows where he came from? Who knows where, where he went? But what was the trigger? There was something that triggered this guy. This guy, while maybe not the most normal guy in the world, something happened to get this guy to start killing in April of 1992, and then he stops in May of 1992. There are some theories about where this guy went or if he went on to other crimes there, Captain. All right, hit me with them. Well, some investigators believe that the I-70 killer may be responsible for two murders in 1993 and an attempted murder in 1994. All of these crimes took place in the state of Texas, and it started in September of 1993 on September 25th when 51-year-old Mary Ann Glasscock was killed in a Fort Worth, uh, in the city of Fort Worth at an Emporium Antiques store. Continues on from there, November 1st, 1993, 22-year-old Amy Vess was shot to death in a dance apparel store in Arlington, Texas. And then we have the January 15th, 1994 attack on 35-year-old Vicki Webb. She luckily survived this attack. She was shot in, in a Houston store at a alternatives gift shop. She briefly spoke to the shooter. So she has a description of the person that shot her. The man shot her and then she did not die. And he attempted to shoot her again, but his gun misfired. Mm. And then he left the scene. There's great debate whether these crimes are connected. And a big part of that comes from the fact that the gun that was used in the I-70 killer case and the six homicides that we've already discussed was not the same gun used in these three Texas cases. However, these start up shortly after, right? The next year after the I-70 killer goes, vanishes. And like I said, he could have just got a new gun and then picked up where he left off at some point. The interesting thing is that what connects these is Interstate 35. And we mentioned Interstate 35 before. Interstate 35 does connect to I-70, and it connects in the general area of where our I-70 killer left off with attacks number four and five, which would be in the Raytown St. Charles area that we discussed earlier. You can pick up I-35 in and around the Kansas City area with I-70. So maybe he just heads a little further south, continues doing what he's doing now with a new murder weapon. Yeah, and I'm I'm sure some people listening are going, well, maybe it's just a different guy. But the description of this individual is very similar. Mm -hmm. And that's why people believe he just got a new gun. We have a surviving witness in the I-35 attack who describes the killer to look similar to that of the description given about the I-70 killer. And in the I-35 killer in the final attack, the vague description that we get here is a white guy, about five foot eight, maybe five foot nine inches tall, reddish hair, 150 to 160 pounds, faint Mm -hmm. beard, brown jacket, and dark pants. So not unlike the other cases, the I-70 cases. Let's get into some suspects here, Captain, before we wrap up. Some of these will be suspects that have been named by law enforcement and some of it named by uh, garage armchair detectives such as ourselves. Mm -hmm. The first suspect that we have to talk about is a man that died in July of 1996, and it is Herb Bowmeister. Okay, who is Herb Bowmeister? He is an American with a bad name. He's an American suspected serial killer. This was a very successful man. Uh, He resided in Westfield, Indiana. Bowmeister was under investigation for murdering over a dozen men in the early 1990s, most of whom were last seen at gay bars. Investigators found the remains of 11 persons, eight which they identified, three remain unidentified to this day, 
on Bo Meister's property. If, in fact, he was the killer of these people, uh, he's dead, so it's been tough to determine that. Mm. It's believed he killed these individuals. He was killing and burying people on their very large property, unbeknownst to his wife and family that lived in a house along with Herb on that property. After an arrest warrant was issued for him, he fled to Canada and then he killed himself before he could be arrested and brought to trial. He never confessed to any of these crimes. His suicide note made no mention of the murder allegations against him. He was, though, later linked to a series of murders of at least nine men along Interstate 70, which occurred in the early to mid-1980s. So this guy is suspected of possibly killing as many as two dozen men. That number certainly unconfirmed, but I think it's his ties to the general area of Interstate 70 and the state of Indiana together that put him on the list of suspects here. As you very obviously know, Captain, this MO, if a Bromeister killed all of these people, is it could not be further from the MO of the I-70 killer. Yeah, or the profile victims. Correct. So this seems like it's it's one of those situations where he is a known active serial killer. He gets tossed on this list just because of that fact. He's also nicknamed, I believe one of the nicknames given to him was the I-70 Strangler. So it doesn't help when your nickname is so much so close to the nickname of the killer that they're seeking. Mm-hmm. I don't think Herb Bomeister had anything to do with these killings. The next suspect that we come to is an individual that was listed and stated in the papers at the time as a possible suspect. His name is Donald Waterhouse, and he's a suspect because on the night of February 29th, 1992, this is just more than a month before the I-70 killings started happening, Waterhouse reportedly shot and killed his mother and stepfather inside their home in Dyersburg, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Now, like the I-70 victims, these two were shot in the head with a 22 caliber weapon. Waterhouse, he vanished. Eventually, his truck was found abandoned in East St. Louis right off of I-70. He evaded police until October. So the thought here, he's eventually caught in Oklahoma, but the thought here being that he's killing while on the run for having killed his parents. He fit the physical description somewhat of the I-70 killer. However, I think what we have here is a situation where you have, because these killings are taking place on such far stretches across this country, and they seem to be motiveless murders. Right. This is really, to me, reminds me of like a Zodiac type killer who's not communicating, who would choose not to communicate with police or the media. Someone who is trying to terrorize. That's what it that's what a terrorist is. Someone who terrorizes the public with with threats. This being the threat of anyone working in any store it, within a series of states could be killed at any time, any random time of the day. Yeah. But again, the key victim is female. Right. Under it, 30. And what I think we have here, Captain, with uh, Waterhouse, as far as he is concerned, I think that the police were under a lot of pressure at the time to throw out a name to right. make it seem like, hey, we, we got we got a trail on somebody. What we would learn 20 years later is that they were bombarded with tips once they started putting out the composite sketch of the suspect. They said that they believed that over 60,000 tips were followed up on. And a lot of them, obviously, false. You know, some of them were, were blatant, false tips where somebody was angry at somebody else right. and threw them under the bus and said, oh, they look like the suspect or he should be your suspect for X, Y, and Z. And it turns out they're baseless speculation there. Right, but a lot of these composite sketches, they kind of look cartoonish. This one... This this drawing has a little bit of soul to it, and it, and it's very uh, disturbing. This guy would uh, would 
freak a lot of people out. Yeah, and this Waterhouse guy, while on the run, um, I don't know what it is. It, I, I have not seen an exact statement, but once they located Waterhouse and once they were going to take him to trial for the killings of his parents, authorities very quickly said that, you know, now that we've caught him, he's not a very high priority suspect in the I-70 killings. Mm -hmm. And then, in fact, we have just in June of uh, 1992, where the St. Charles, Missouri police chief, David King, announced that Waterhouse was no longer a top suspect in the I-70 killings. That brings us to Donald Blom, a.k.a. Donald Prince. Born 1949, he is an American who was sentenced to life in prison for the killing of Kathleen Katie Pryor in 1999. He's a registered sex offender involved in five cases of kidnapping and sexual assault prior to Katie's murder. He is suspected to be a serial killer by case investigators. Blom is serving his prison sentence at a medium security facility in Minnesota. This assumption, though, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I'm not really certain how he ends up on this list of potential suspects. Boy, he killed somebody. There you go. His killings and his attacks. Look, this guy, at the end of the day, he's a rapist and murderer. None of the I-70 killings were sexual in nature. None of that took place. So the police seem, again, here, possibly desperate to get names out in the press and this may be one that was just thrown out there. But was it the start of something? Was this how I'm going to do it? Fantasize about it. That will turn it into something else later. Where he was once a hands-off killer and then became a hands-on killer. Right. Next up on our list, we have Ralph Leon Jackson, also known as Ralphman. Old Ralphman. He's a real prick monger. Ralphman, or Ralph Jackson, he is convicted of shooting two people on the Blue Ridge Parkway in 2010. And unfortunately, he killed one of those victims. And if it wasn't for the the courageous efforts of the other victim, he, he, he thought he killed her as well. So what we have here, Captain, is a situation where this guy, it seems that he killed these people at random. And I think that it's the random nature and given his age, he was 57 years old when he was convicted of the 2010 crimes. And that would put him in the general age range for our I 70 killer and his, we're going to go back and back to this, but we need to put a red flag and a marker on it right here where we say he his physical description is not unlike that of the I-70 killer, but right. you've seen the picture. It's it's kind of a vague description of it the is. I-70 killer, right? Yeah. So he looks somewhat like the description. He's about the same age, but really I think it here is the randomness of the crime. This crime that he committed, it almost looks like he went out to the Blue Ridge Parkway that night hoping to see someone or some ones and was determined to gun them down from his vehicle. So that puts him on the list of potential suspects for the I 70 killer, as well as he's, his name comes up in the colonial parkway murders as well. Yeah. I just don't like that many of these, these suspects. Well, I think it's because there's no really good clues here in any of these cases that we have what I would consider great suspects. Well, I also think it's because the MO is so strange. It it definitely seems like he was targeting a certain type of victim, but it doesn't seem like it was sexual in nature. Like I said, could have led to that later. Maybe it was just a fantasy, and he wasn't willing to uh, take the risk to take the time to live out those fantasies. But also... The strange just to steal a little bit of money. It's just, it's very strange MO. Well, here's the name that you'll recognize, and some of our listeners will recognize as well, the long time listeners anyway. 
The next suspect that we're going to discuss is Neil Falls. Mm -hmm. Who is Neil Falls? Well, that name may sound familiar to you because he was mentioned in our vanishing women case. That is the case of six missing women and several that were killed in the Southern Ohio area. Why did he come up on that uh, in those episodes? Well, that was because he is a man that was killed Mm -hmm. during what was believed to be the attempted killing of a woman. Um, Maybe rape would be involved. I don't know. He at least threatened her with both where he met a woman on the internet shows up at the door and things turn bad real quick. And according to our victim who survived and killed Neil falls, she says that Neil falls told him, told her, look, I'm going to prison for a long time for this. It could be for rape or for murder. You're the one that's going to decide it. Well, she decided it and it was for neither. He wasn't going to make it to prison. He did because of her luckily. Now, When police start looking through this Neil Falls guy and looking through his vehicle, very disturbing stuff. They find firearms, handcuffs, shovels, a pickaxe, several bladed weapons, including a hatchet and several knives. And he had a bulletproof vest on him. Now, he was a good distance from where he lived. Yeah. And so the thought here is not just that this guy is willing to travel to kill, but some people did some very interesting work because remember we have our I-70 killer who would have been in his early twenties to maybe mid to late thirties. That again, being the big window for the age description of our potential killer here. This, I found this on Reddit and Web Sleuths, where several people had found an, an interesting little thing here in Neil Falls' background. In early 1992, we don't have an exact date, Neil Falls moves to his father's house in Kansas. Well, the I-70 murders began in April, on April 8th of 1992. And then three days later in April, we have the murders in Wichita, Kansas. So the home that he was living at Greensburg, Kansas is about an hour and a half West of Wichita. So this guy, and he does look, you know, at the time of his death, this is a guy that moved around. He lived in many different States. And when this woman killed him, the FBI and police immediately came out and said, we want to know one, where this guy was. We want to put together a complete timeline of him but we have him getting uh, driving violations, speeding tickets and such in multiple States over the years. Mm -hmm. So not only did he live and move around, but when he was living at certain places, he was traveling to other States as well. And this is a guy that they thought he might be driving or flying and going elsewhere and killing people and then returning to his home. The interesting thing here is we've put him within an hour and a half of, the killings in Wichita back in 1992. Now the picture of him at the time of his death is kind of a fat version of the description given of the I 70 killer. And if you go on to web sleuths or Reddit and you'll look up this Neil falls, I 70 killer angle, you'll see that what they did here was they put a picture from his, I believe this is his senior year high school yearbook a picture of, of his senior year in high school, followed by the sketches of the I-70 killer, along with the fat version that I pointed out of the, the, the chubby cheeks version of Neil Falls from the time that he, roughly around the time that he was killed. And that's Falls, F-A-L-L-S, not Balls. I know you're thinking it's Neil Balls, but it's no, it's Falls. Well, and the other thing here too, Captain, that's interesting about Falls is uh, Texas 1993 and the 1994 killings, the I-35 killer. Again, some believe these could be related, could be linked, could be the same killer as the I-70 killer. Falls' father, who he was living with at the time, passes away in 1995, and he moved back to Oregon. And of course, there's no more I-70 kill killings or I-35 killings believed after that 90, 1994 attempted killing. Yeah, but... So possible 
reason yeah. for why it stopped in that area would be that Neil Falls moved out of the area. Well, again, I think uh, his age is something that I like because I feel like these killings, these I-70 killings, are, it's like a step towards a direction. It's almost like a precursor to something else that is going to happen. And again, the money taking not huge amounts of money, but taking the time to take that money seems like something somebody with not much of a future would do, but also something that maybe, you know, a teenager, early 20 year old would do. You're working under the theory that this guy might be earlier or toward the, the younger end of the spectrum. Right. That, what we're talking about as far as our eyewitnesses go. Now you're exactly right because with Neil falls, he would have been 22 years old back in 92 when these homicides first started up. Right. And a couple hundred bucks to me when I was, well, heck now, but I mean, even back then it was a lot of money, like 200 bucks or 300 bucks. Oh, that's a lot of money. I actually think if in fact that this guy is a cold calculated killer that if he's all there that if he's not on drugs not mental problems or both like one of the witnesses stated that i think that the robbery or the the taking of the money is really just to throw the police off i guess i don't know what they're he's throwing them off of um because everything the murder still took place but He's an interesting one because he would have been 22 at the time when they started. And then again, that window of time, he is there roughly in that general vicinity of that area when the killings start. And then when they stop after the I-35 killings stop, he's gone in 95, he moves to Oregon. So I think that's one of the more interesting ones. One, uh, one more name here, captain. And this is one that, I would be shocked if our listeners don't know because we've covered a case that he is potentially linked to as well so many times is Thomas Bruce. And if you remember correctly, he is a Delphi suspect. He is a known killer. And I think it's people have linked him to the I-70 killer simply because Indiana's part of the the story for the I-70 killer Two of the known events linked to the I-70 killer took place in the state of Indiana. And his crimes, he was in St. Louis when he got picked up just a year or so ago. Because what did he do? Remember, he went into that Catholic supply store. Right. And he took several, he took, a, a, I believe it was a customer and a couple employees back to the back where there were some sexual assaults that took place and homicide that took place. And he was on the run for a very short period of time before they tracked him down and found him. Uh, his age would put him at about the right age. Again, I, I think that the age range for the I 70 killer is, is vast. Yeah. I mean, it's just big. It's so it gets difficult to, to really pinpoint down and say, Oh, the age is right. Mm hmm when we're talking about a span of 15 years, maybe for our potential, uh, I 70 killer. But Bruce is an interesting one simply because he, he does this attack. He's locked up. He's been quiet ever since some people are trying to link him to Delphi. Some people are trying to link him to other cases. And because of the nature of the known attack that he did, the known homicide that he did do, that there's no question about it's similar in ways to that of the I 70 killer. Yeah. One of my issues though, is I, I feel like some of these actions of this crime show again, either maybe somebody that's just not mentally stable, then they're probably locked up for something else or this, these actions are a little immature, which doesn't really go with the, the sketch in my mind. Cause to me, the sketch seems older. So it's, it's a very difficult case. It's very difficult because again, it, it goes to why did this even start in the first place? And then where did this killer go? He he's not apprehended for these homicides. At least he may be, as you said, locked up for something else, 
Uh, at this point, if he was older, he may have even passed away. This is an interesting case because it's one that, that unlike many other cases, it would seem that there would be very few clues for law enforcement to work with, to finding this guy. And really, to be honest with you, Captain, the only hope that I have that the I-70 killer is ever identified I mean, you're talking 26, 27, 28 years later. Mm-hmm. Very little clues to go on back in 1992. Well, again, the investigators so said at the time on the one homicide, this case was cold by the end of the week. Right. There's so little to go on. We don't even have a profile of the suspect. Right. And that's the homework for our garage army. If somebody can find a psychological profile of the I-70 killer, please send it to us and we'll review it on off the record, because like I said, it was stated multiple times in the paper that these different departments were going to work with the FBI to see if they could put together a psychological profile of the I-70 killer. What we do have is months later where somebody says, we don't even know if we have enough to put together a profile of this guy. And this guy's had five different events, six different homicides in the course of a month. Mm Hmm. It also wouldn't shock me if we have a situation where if drugs or mental health and both, especially if both were involved, that this individual, once they linked the crimes, may have discarded the weapon or committed suicide or both at the time. And it's not been linked for whatever reason. Again, if he's willing to go 10 hours travel time between two of the different homicides, who knows how far he went for for any of them to begin with. I think the key here, Captain, I the only ho- hope I really hold in identifying this killer is that gun. You know, the police believe that they've narrowed it down to the make and model of the gun used in all of the attacks. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a unique weapon. And I think that if they could find someone with that weapon, if he's not discarded that weapon, there's a chance that, This is a prized possession of his. Yeah, you find the gun, you find the one. Thank you so much for hanging out with us in the garage again and again and again for all these great stories. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading? This week, we are recommending Killer on the Road, Violence, and the American Interstate by Ginger Strand. Killer on the Road tells the entwined stories of America's highways and its highway killers. You can find that great title and many more at truecrimegarage.com. And make sure when you're at the website, you sign up on the mailing list. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter. 